So I think that's a great uh, quantitative overlook. We're now going to switch to a qualitative. Um, we're going to see what the, the view from the operators are. So if the next panel would like to come up, we're heading to, you know who you are. Do you want me to introduce you? Um, we're going to look at operating in Asia. Um, great. Thanks very much for coming up. <laughs> you're the one who... Come on, you knew, Richie, you're up. Come on, there's no hurry. Anywhere, Anywhere you like. And, uh, great. So, Jenny, sit wherever you like. So we'd, it's great to have, uh, on my far right, Jolie Howard from Tag Aviation, Richard Porter from Executet, and Joe Reckling from Jet Aviation here. Um, okay, you heard, you heard from Jeff. Um, how's business, Jolie? Well, business is uh, doing all right, but I think it's uh, fairly challenging. From uh, Jeff's uh, you know, uh, speech earlier, it's, uh, you know, the market is uh, you know, a little bit depressing. So I think challenge for us is obviously the risk of people selling up airplanes and then not enough aircraft coming into the market. So, which means you know, competition among each other, you know, just uh, fighting for the market share. So I think that is you know, the, uh, the situation you know, we don't like to see. And we've seen it in other markets you know, have suffered. So you know, this is something we like not to see. So it's tough at tag. Uh, Richard, is it like just booming at Exec Jack? <laughs> uh, no, not at all. No, I, th I think I'd echo what Jolie said there. Um, it's very much, a, we're, we feel like we're in a consolidation phase. I think this year we'll, we'll use this time to, to, to uh, rebuild. I think you know that we uh, changed tax slightly uh, in the last year from a, a centralised service model and we've gone to a bit more of a devolved uh, model here, so we've built up our resources in regions. So I think that's very much where we're at. That's the that's the snapshot. So when you've gone for the devolved model, are you saying that consolidation doesn't work? Uh, I'm saying the central. Yes, actually, I think I think it's uh, well known. Patrick was was happy to say he's made a mistake with the centralised model for operations and for the airworthiness team, and bringing those into the region a, is a better fit for our customers. So we're. Yeah, we, we've done that piece of work here and in the Middle East and in South Africa, and it's uh, certainly the feedback's been very positive. So, Joe, you, you know, tougher tag, tougher exec jet, boom times at Jet Aviation. Not quite, but um, sort of agree with what Richard says, you know, in terms of the consolidated model in jet aviation. We've sort of divided it up into three regions. We find that works best, we're able to get close to the customers. For us, um, if you look at your Slido, fairly optimistic, I would sort of pick our outlook at that level as well. Um, there are challenges. We've obviously, there was Hawker Pacific, there was the purchase of Hawker Pacific. For those of you who don't know, I was actually part of a company that was acquired and essentially, so it's been quite a focus in the last year or so to actually integrate those two businesses into Jet Aviation. Pleased to, pleased to say that that has gone very well, uh, specifically in the Asia. The focus was in the Asia region. There are challenges. We have, we've got a huge spread across Asia Pacific. So when you look at our business, we've got different market segments. So the outlook for Asia, if you took Asia Pacific or even the China, China we're expecting a bit of a slowdown. We have seen the slowdown across our FBO business in Shanghai as well as in the MRO space. But when you look at Southeast Asia, how we position in that, we've got a fairly optimistic outlook for the future. So you will work for global companies, um, what's the, when you talk to your colleagues at, you know, Jet Aviation US, you know, they're having a boom. No, they're not actually having a boom at this stage compared to 2018, although uh, that's maybe relative to the targets we set, but if you look at it on a year on year, the business is still performing. It's the business activity is still up, right? But I wouldn't describe it as a boom. Market conditions are tough. And a lot. You've got to work, you've got to compete, there's significant competition in the marketplace. Right, but in Asia, do you feel you've got a tougher job than your colleagues in America? Um, I think it's just a different market in terms of size and scale. I wouldn't say it's tougher. Uh, the US market is, is more focused around aircraft management and the FBO business. We're in the MRO space and I challenge anyone in this room to say that MRO is not a tough business. It is, it always has been and it always will be. Is that why you've sold it, Richie? 
<laughs> I didn't sell it. But, uh, but no, I think, I think really um, uh, the MRO business for, for Lux Aviation was not felt as a core business and it just, just looks like one of those genuine transactions that was a win-win for all parties. So, yeah, I think we're very, very proud that, um, that, that Dassault look at ExecuJet in that light and actually um, felt that way about keeping the ExecuJet brand as well, which uh, we've all worked so hard to, to, to build up over the years. So, no, I think that was a genuine win-win, to be honest. Jody, which do you think is the most competitive business, management or maintenance or... You don't have an FBO here, but you do in Europe. Um, I think, you know, for Asia, they're all fairly competitive. I think certainly um, from my time in the industry is I've seen, you know, management companies started out from, you know, fairly uh, at not as competitive to now is becoming really fragmented. Um, market is, you know, is a lot more of a smaller operator with one or two aircraft than, you know, um, bigger operator, you probably don't have, you know, you only have a handful of really big operator, but you have a lot more, you know, aircraft management company have, you know, less than five airplanes. So, you know, I think we've seen it in other market. It's just, uh, you know, I see that as probably Asia is, uh, uh, you know, having that trend now as well. So it is how the market developed and then, you know, it is, uh, you know, for management company, they really, you know, for to stay competitive, what they're offering need to be in, in touch with the market. So I think, you know, positioning themselves and constantly evolving to meet the market needs are uh, important. So I think management, you know, we've seen, you know, is becoming more and more competitive. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because you, you talk about startup operators and all three of you have got phenomenal, you know, companies. You, you invest hugely in um, you know, safety and, and systems. But I'm not sure buyers, owners, necessarily differentiate between the brands. Would you agree with that? Yes. Well, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I agree. I think um, that is, you know, we, we operate in a highly regulated environment for operator. Everything we do, every single flight we do, every flight we dispatch, you know, there are regulations in place, there's safety measure in place. Um, we're probably one of the, you know, together with the maintenance size, there's not many room for you to actually, you know, go step outside without being compliant. It's really, you know, there's none. So I think to understand really what's important and, you know, how you look at and choosing the quality of an operator, I don't think it's been enough education. I'm not sure if the OEM is educating them, you know, enough because when they, or the brokers is, is doing that, I think it needs to be an industry-wide effort to, you know, to do that because it is, you know, we all at stake when something happens. So yes, you know, it's important. I agree with what Jodie's saying over there. There's, there's a lot of education that needs to go into it so the buyer can actually understand that what is involved in managing that asset. So the flight safety, the fact that we've got the pilots, we've got the infrastructure and that, that, that is, those are important key assets that are required to run it. So the smaller operators who uh, as Jody said, you know, in the, in the aircraft management space, it's ex exceptionally difficult for them because it's relationship-based. What are they offering their service offering on? Price by itself, they're giving it away. Um, that's not good for the industry. It's not good for the, for the owners at the end of the day. But is it hard for you because you're, you're owned by, you know, General Dynamics, which is a, a serious company? Yeah. Um, it, it, I was having this conversation with an operator in Europe, and he was going, you know, compared to our peers, we're much better. We're, everyone knows, and I was going, it doesn't help when you're talking to investors. Is it hard for you to go, you know, these guys are loss making, these guys are loss making, but does that go back to management? Do they understand that? Well, there is. I mean, obviously, we, we run the business. We run the business to to the, if you want to call it, to the general dynamics standard that we do. I don't find that exceptionally hard to actually to meet that standard. The standard is there. We've set it. We've got the infrastructure in place for it. Um, when you have conversations outside with other people, yes, often there, there's there's a different perception. You know, especially if you're talking to an individual operator or an owner, and they want to, they, they say, well, I can get this from over here for a lot lower price, but the fact is what we're trying to offer is something you can trust us. There's trust involved in being able to take care of your asset. R Richard, do you see less operators? Because one of the things we talk a lot about is consolidation, Lux Aviation consolidated, but it almost seems like as soon as you buy an operator, the management team goes off and launches another one. I'm not convinced we've seen any consolidation. 
Well, we've obviously seen consolidation um, in the marketplace, but yeah, you're right. As soon as um, um, one gets consolidated, somebody else pops up. And, and this is the, the trouble with the quality of the contracts that you have. And they're quite portable. People tend to take their clients with them and set up another operation. So yeah, I think that's, uh, that, that's a, an issue for us. But it's also our own problem to de demonstrate to customers our points of difference. You know, we have, to, we have to show them that it's not just about compliance. Safety is not just about compliance. You can be compliant and unsafe. Um, so we really have to work on that aspect of things. And also just try and explain to them the difference between cheap and value. You know, if you're getting something cheap, it, buy cheap, buy twice, as my grandmother used to say. Um, okay, so... Jeff started off, off telling us how awful the market is. What's your, um, what's your biggest concern? What's your biggest short-term pro problem? What's the, you know? Well, for, for me, I'll, I'll go back to the operator. There are too many operators. There are too many operators that are not profitable. Uh, there are too many operators that are not paying their suppliers. There are too many operators not paying their staff. And I think when, when they ultimately fail, it's, it's a, a bad, show on the industry at large. I mean, that's the brutal, honest truth of where we're at. Although they, they don't fail, do they? There's so many businesses out there which are running on cash flow that hang on and... We've had some, maybe not management companies, but some fairly high-profile failures in this region. And, you know, things were obviously going to fail. And, uh, yeah, when it happened, everyone just threw their arms up and shrugged their shoulders. So, look... Uh, I think you need more businesses that are well run and profitable in, in the real world than, than we've got today. I'd agree with that. I think so. You need more of that. We've got very much of a fragmented industry in terms of smaller operators and that, that actually damage the industry in the long term. It would be better if we actually had well run businesses. They don't need to be large businesses. They just need to be exceptionally well run businesses. And it's a classic large company saying we need to get rid of smaller operators. <laughs> you may think so, but um, if you think about it, when, every time those small operators and those small companies are often customers of ours as well, or potential future customers, clients. So what we really want is the best, at the end of the day, the best value proposition for a customer who is in aviation, who owns the asset and understands what's required to look after that asset. But Alistair, in any industry, price dumping is not healthy. No, and I, I think it's always unique that you have, in, in this industry, you have so many people who, there's so many small operators who are in it for love and, you know, of the industry and, and you know, and, and you want to get rid of them. <laughs> we want rational behaviour. We want rational behaviour, rational competition. Do you think we'll ever have that in business aviation? That's a hard question to answer because <laughs> you know the answer to that. I think we've seen this in other regions, though, where people have got into it and thought there's easy money in this or it's a sexy industry, and then that hasn't worked out, and then there has been consolidation. So, yes, it will happen here. It's part of probably the life cycle of, of, of the whole Asia-Pacific region. Jolie, is think... there easy money in business <laughs> aviation? It's, it's actually, you know, very difficult to do well, you know, it's, it's probably low uh, barrier of entry, but it's very difficult and it does take lots of time and cost lots of money to do well and really to have a good product. But I think go back to your question is what is the short term? Short term, you know, really we're all suffering from a downturn of the market. So what that means is go back to what I said earlier is people are fighting for market share from each other and that's not a healthy growth. So what we need to see is healthy growth. And, you know, operators should find themselves, you know, in their own positioning, you know, maybe whatever they offer is for different types of customer, you know, people need to find their space to survive, just like in any product. So, um, and, you know, just uh, by pricing, you know, like lowering the pricing is not the way to go, just like what we've seen not only in our business, but many other businesses as well. So I think the key thing is still, you know, what is sustainable, you know, business model for you and, you know, each operator need to determine that and uh, by lowering, lowering the price, getting your market share in the short term may not be actually, you know, a long term benefit. So, um, you know, what's worrying, it's, you know, to us is the market is, you know, in, in a stage where it's going through a downturn where low utilization, you know, record low and all that, that affects generally, you know, revenue on many, you know, areas.
many areas for I'm sure for trip support company, you know, for people who you know doing business, then you know their service is based on utilization. So this is the short term. Is really that is impacting uh, you know revenue gain in the, in in what we see in the sh you know short term future. So we've got a question um, from the room. Define a small operator. Let's let's look at that. When do you start? getting economies of scale. How many aircraft do you need? It depends if you've got a, a single type fleet or a mixed fleet. I think, I think our analytics sort of look at about um, seven aircraft if you've got a single fleet, but it's probably double that if you've got a mixed fleet, something like that. And that's a painful growing pain bit. You've got you know, very good operators that run four or five aircraft. Once you go beyond up to that 14, 15, there are obvious growing pains there because you need more infrastructure. It's, it's just a difficult thing to keep the quality of service up and everything as you're growing. So that, that would be that's sort of our internal discussions. Yeah. That's where we feel about it. And you sort of find they go from four to seven and then, the, then three of them peel off again and they're back to four. And it seems to be sort of a circle that keeps repeating itself. Well, they four can be a perfect size, can't it? If you've yeah. got a, a boutique bespoke operator, yeah. it's not bad, a few owners. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, but when they've got a pilot shortage or they can't access something, then they start running into problems. <laughs> it's a big question. Um, big operators. Um, so the nice question from the audience. The USA and Europe are experiencing a severe <laughs> crew shortage. Um, are you finding the same thing in Asia Pacific? Chair? I could probably, I probably can't answer that from a crew point of view, but I could probably answer it from an MRO point of view. We do, from an MRO perspective, one of the concerns we have in the short term is a long-term view on ensuring we've got sufficient manpower to meet the future demand that we're going to have. Which I think is fair, actually. I think we always focus on pilots, and we don't focus enough on engineers and yeah. maintenance tech. Yeah. And I mean, to, to say it in this room over here, we sort of work actively with the Economic Development Board of Singapore. They are helpful. They are sort of putting kids in through school. We provide apprentices um, and positions to help the training. If you, go, if you go down to the Australian part of the world as well, we do look at it. But there's, there's, we work with the industry quite actively to promote apprentices for the future because there is a significant shortage in the MRO space for skilled labour. And that will impact safety, compliance, uh, customer service and that. But do you want to comment on... Oh, on, on the, the pilot part? side, well, salaries have gone up over the past two or three years, so it's a supply and demand. So, yeah, I think um, we've seen that the um, US airlines have also sucked up pilots that perhaps would, in the past may have come to this region and worked for us. So, yeah, definitely, I, I still see an issue. Yeah, definitely a shortage of quality crew, you know, absolutely, because you have to bring them from overseas, there's not enough local supply, so it's it just still ongoing. Um, so, why don't you look at cadet programs, some from the audience are saying? We do, actually, in the Australian context, we are looking at cadet programs. Good answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. People say that operators have the hardest time. Do they forget that FBO is 100% reliant on operators and they cannot just pick up the building and airport? So basically, I think this question is, operators are terrible customers. <laughs> oh, we're, we're both FBO and, and, and operators, so uh, yeah, across both of those sectors. Um, I'm still not quite sure what the point of the question is, really. <laughs> I think you can't pick up an FBO, and I think that's a useful point. Yeah, OK, I see. So, yeah, you can only drive the traffic. Oh, but, but, I mean, the traffic is, the business is what it is at your FBO, and it's quite hard to um, I increase that traffic, I guess. The FBO is also very different depending which part of the world you're in. Mm. The US is very much more of a field-driven service industry, and over here it's more sort of ground handling and sort of passengers. So... We've got a question from an offshore registry. Um, how much of your Asia fleet is registered in the US and why? Julie? We, we have uh, probably um, 
you know, close to 40% of our fleet are registered in the U.S. Um, it's really operationally friendly and, uh, you know, we've been you know, well established that, you know, e easy to have, um, uh, get technicians to maintain it, you know, pilots to fly it. So it's really for the ease of operation reason that uh, traditionally has been popular. But I think now with other jurisdictions coming up, also very operationally friendly uh, without, you know, uh, with a simpler of ownership structure. So I think now it's becoming popular as well. So we do uh, have, uh, you know, lots of other, you know, uh, easy to use um, uh, registration in our fleet. So, you know, we don't see an increasing trend in end registration anymore. It's the one that have registered a number of years ago, they've kept it. But, you know, for new aircraft coming into our fleet, whether it's pre owned or uh, whether it's brand new, uh, I think, you know, there are other options. Anyone else want to comment? We've got another question, which is the best registry? Um, which is the most popular registry now, and why? I'm assuming someone's planted that question for one of you. Well, it, it, there's not a one-size-fits-all, so I think you have to look at your customer, look at what he wants to do. Maybe it's a commercial operation, maybe he's an EU citizen, so you know, there, there really isn't a one-size-fits-all. You need to have, have your expertise and make recommendations according to what the pros and cons are of that particular operation. So if, if you told me who actually planted that question, I'll tell you which registry was the best. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe, this is a nice one for you. Um, how do MROs feel about the OEMs taking all the business back to the factory? Do you, do you, you know, as someone who works with General Dynamics, do you feel it's bad that you know, OEMs are trying to crack down on independent MROs? They've been, depending on what segment of the industry you look at, but um, I wouldn't say it's bad. I think one thing I said before is about rational behaviour. The one thing you do find with the OEMs taking the maintenance back or running an in-source strategy is they will be rational about it. The purpose of them doing so, if you sit in discussions with them, is to improve the customer sort of service rankings that they get from customers. Customers are looking to buy an aircraft. Ultimately, you know, there is, there is sort of the trade-off. Are they good at MRO? Can they really be good at MRO? The answer is possibly yes. They can get there, but they'd have to invest the time and the, the time and the effort into that. The purpose of what they really want to do is to sell more aircraft. I don't think there's any issues with the OEMs um, being in the maintenance side of the business. We will continue to compete on our service offering. We provide premium service two different people. We also, we don't represent one OEM, Jet Aviation. There is a distinction between the Gulfstream service centres and Jet Aviation in the sense that we do provide operators who have a mixed fleet the opportunity for them to get their aircraft serviced with us. Do you think we're going to see the days when warranty work just goes to OEMs or OEM facilities? Well, I'm not sure if the OEMs will be able to. If you look at the marketplace that we're in, AG Pacific, whether they'll actually be able to have the coverage to do, to do all the warranty work because there is, a, depending on the aircraft type, depending on if it's a large cabin jet or if it's smaller aircraft, um, they will have to have facilities in place and the economic, the cost benefit will sort of outweigh that for them. So I think there will still be room for us to do some form of warranty work. As you all are aware, Hawker Pacific used to be part of the Textron Aviation distributor, channel partner network. We're now sort of on a preferred customer uh, set up with them and that, that means our business is evolving but at this point we are still servicing the customers. We are still there to service the broad market. Do we have any questions, um, old school questions with the microphone? So, Jolie, we've seen TAG sell its maintenance business in Europe. You know, how do you see the, the new maintenance uh, battleground? Uh, yeah, I think strategically that was the, uh, you know, the right thing for TAG to uh, sell the maintenance business. I think the, um, I think if, you know, it's not uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we, we don't have it in Asia that, you know, we will be perform part of that, you know, because we don't do any base maintenance, first of all, you know, our, our coverage is uh, mainly in Hong Kong and Macau. So um, I think, you know, Asia is a lot more complex, uh, you know, um, environment for MRO, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is still geographically, it's very big, it's very challenging for, you know, coverage and licensing. So I think it's, 
you know, for the OEM, we have to actually look at more of a hybrid rather than a traditional model of how they can work with the other MROs. So I'm not sure the traditional model will continue to work with them taking away a lot of the base maintenance and, you know, how is that going to, they still would need some form of help from, you know, the MRO. Uh, you know, to, to support. So, you know, I think, you know, it's really probably time to be a little bit creative to think how, you know, can, you know, rather building up yourself everything, is it really something that you, you can work with some of the MRO, you know, to make your coverage better, uh, effective, you know, and instead of trying to conquer the world, because it's very complex, you know, doing, you know, in Asia. So I think, uh, you know, from tax perspective is uh, certainly um, we will continue to keep our, um, you know, uh, maintenance business that, you know, at the location we're at right now. I just want to add one other thing on, on into that aspect. So if you took Dassault, Dassault buying the ExecuJet and the TAG businesses, um, they didn't increase capacity in the market, right? So if you increase the capacity in your market, you run the risk that we sort of, there'll be sort of run a race to the bottom and you get, you get people get setting up MRO because they think it's a very easy and or lucrative business. So it's a rational move by the OEMs. I'd rather have that happening than additional capacity being added into a market that's already challenging. Although I would be tempted to set up an MRO just to sell it to an OEM in a few years. <laughs> yeah, but the, o, but the OEMs are a bit smarter than that. <laughs> oh, they would be oh, such they? a lifetime <laughs> investment. <It's, laughs> don't know when the return may be. <laughs> Um, okay, we've got lots of questions. Anyone want to do an old school question? Yes, Simon from, uh, I'm coming to you now. Oh, it's a big drop. It's not so much a question um, as really to support what the panel is saying. I think uh, I really appreciate your comments. You're being very uh, frank and very straight with us, which is, which is great. I don't know where the question came from with regards to who's the best registry, but I, I think the comment that was made by the panel is exactly right. Choosing a registry, I think, is, is about um, what fits best. I couldn't agree more. You know, you've got so many different difficult and detailed decisions to make when you're operating, purchasing and operating an aircraft. And so the choice of registry is just one of those uh, decisions that you've got to make. The criteria I noticed was one of the questions up there. I think it really depends on what you want to try and achieve in um, the purchase of your aircraft and then what you're trying to achieve in terms of its operation, whether it's private, where it's commercial, where it's geographically based. And so there's lots of very detailed thoughts that have to go into this and, and clearly you need to get some um, sound advice. And there is no one size fits all. Um, I think you've got to tailor it to, to the solution that you're looking for. I thought you were going to say the best choice is any registry between England and Ireland. Uh, <laughs> any, any more questions? Okay. Um, I think you've answered the question. Are management companies employed pilots and CREs the biggest threat to your business fleet retention in Asia? Uh, no, I don't see them as a, a threat. They're all stakeholders. I mean, uh, they're all stakeholders in our business. Um, I, I don't see them as a massive threat to, the, to our industry. As I said earlier, I think the threat to the industry is more that businesses need to be well run. Um, that, that's really why I see the risk. What is the biggest threat to the industry in uh, Asia? I, I think I said earlier, I answered that one, really is, I just think these operators um, failing is, is, a, is a real threat to, the, to our reputation. So I mean, small operators? Not just small, uh, not small operators, poorly run operators. I'll make a distinction. That translates through to very good small, well. small operators. Uh, so poorly run operators? Poorly run operators. So, um, do you want to name a... a <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you turn that off? <laughs> I agree uh, that definitely would have an impact when things are not run well. But I think also, uh, you know, the biggest threat to the industry also is the infrastructure that, uh, you know, supported um, with so many airports now congested, you know, with a slot problem, you know, we, when we dispatch, dispatch a trip, you know, from an operator point of view, to fly the aircraft, make it, you know, dispatchable, make it fly, is, is something we do on a daily basis. But now, you know, doing a trip to get that slot, get that landing, get that parking, become such a major issue that, you know, c customer choosing operator based on the ability to get a landing slot, based on the ability to be able to get that parking and completely ignoring so many other things that goes on with that operation. And that is, to me, is not sustainable. To me, is a threat because 
it should not be, you know, it should be the easiest thing that we do and that's what we should be doing all the time and that's what the operator do. So I think the infrastructure problem is really becoming a problem, you know, in, certainly in greater China region. The availability of land to build for infrastructure in the short term. Um, one of the questions is, um, sorry, building, building like tension. Uh, India, does anyone have any plans for India? Uh, no, <laughs> we don't have any plans. Uh, India is not my territory. It's uh, I have to defer to Mike Berry here from our Dubai office. No, none from us at this point. No. Um, when I was part of Hawker Pacific, we, we, we took two swings at, um, at India. Uh, we weren't successful. Um, some people would say that was a blessing in disguise because if you, think, if you think doing business in China is tough, they said try to do business in India. All right? But um, that is setting up there, just in terms of dealing with the bureaucracy of getting, getting a business set up and to run efficiently there. But, um, India is a, is, a, is a big market, and um, I'm not saying, we, at the moment, we have no plans. No active plan for us to expand in India. Okay. That was it's available for the small operators to go. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> small well-run operators, as opposed That's to the, one. <laughs> the, the badly. Um, are you aware of the new tax relief in the USA for investors? in aircraft flying in the USA? Yeah, I've no expertise in tax whatsoever. No. Is that personally? <laughs> you don't, no, you don't pay it. Especially personally, yeah. Yeah, no. I can't answer that. Okay. Um, we'll get someone else to answer that throughout the conference. We've got some US lawyers. Um, uh, do you, this, I think this is from a crewing solution company. Do any of you have plans to take over startup crewing solutions? Would anyone like to buy a startup crewing solution company? That's a no then. Um, <laughs> um, I'm just here to ask the question. We do run a staffing business in the US. So if there was, if there was an opportunity that, um, that fitted into the overall sort of strategy, we'd take a look at it. You've also bought one in Europe, haven't you? Yeah. Hello. Um, is there still an argument against boutique operators? Let's rephrase that. Let's be honest. Boutique operators are better than the big global ones, aren't they? <laughs> I don't know how a boutique operator can actually provide the same amount of infrastructure that is required, you know, if your fleet is growing. So I'm not sure it's resources versus uh, being small, you know, being limited resources, you can actually achieve the same quality because you need infrastructure to do things in our business and you need to have that resources. Running boutique, which means your lack of something, then, you know, how, how is boutique? If boutique, in terms of customer service, that's different. Boutique, in terms of infrastructure support, I don't know how they can operate with, that, with the same quality. So that's the large operator telling you no. Um, um, let's, <laughs> and I'm just saving you guys from but doing that. But you said it very nicely. <laughs> Are you using big data to improve or grow your business? Or small data, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're certainly using a lot of data. I mean, we do find that our, our customers are becoming more sophisticated, um, looking for more reporting, more analytics, more statistics, so that they can understand it. I think more of their life cycle of the aircraft, but certainly, I don't know if you'd really call it big data, but lots of reporting, and lots of statistical analysis. Is, we're, we're being asked for that quite often and providing that. So. Are you finding owners want to be able to access more data on their aircraft? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, uh, very much so. I, I think they, we've gone away from just having a 12-month budget for the aircraft. We're really looking at the whole full ownership life cycle. They're, they're sophisticated enough to understand that there, there will be an acquisition, there will be uh, yeah, a sale of that aircraft at some point in time, and they, they want to understand better when that sweet spot is. We do. We use big data. We've still got some way to go in that. But um, if, you, if you talk to customers, one thing from a customer service perspective is they want constant communication of knowing the status of where the aircraft is at. And big data is one way for you to help achieve that too. So you have a single point of contact that can access the data 
and actually be the conduit to the customer. So this is in from a maintenance perspective. When the aircraft's in, the operator brings in his aircraft for maintenance, and you know we normally say it'll be returned to service within four weeks, and then they want to know after three weeks what it's going on, what the status of the aircraft is. So big data is a facilitator and enabler to achieve that as well. And is that something you've seen in the last three years, five years? Yes, depending on what market segment it's in, um, you know, whether it's the large cabin operators and that definitely in that space. Um, if, you, if you're talking about sort of uh, guys who own much smaller aircraft than that, we have, we have other customers where we do like a fleet management type of arrangement. We have to provide them with constant information. So it's been around for more than five years. Okay. Uh, if I can add to that mm. also is we do see... Um, the data are very important to our client, but at the same time, is it's it's the data are so important for um, operator to actually be able to communicate to the client what we actually do behind the scenes because it's not just about your catering, it's not just about if your cabin is clean. That's also very important, but it's so much data behind, and I think. You know, for us, what we've done is to push that data out to be a lot more, you know, communicative to the client. Is to actually let them see all those information behind. How, what does the flight look like? You know, what, what information they have related to, you know, their airplane. So, uh, we've taken the step of, you know, having a customer app is to have those data we already have, but you know, provide that interfacing for them to see. So, I do see that as something, you know, can be very. Uh, you know, differentiating ourselves, you know, to actually we are letting the customers see what we do behind the scenes more and more. Okay, question from the audience. How do you stop pilots from overpowering the company? Well, we use key account managers really to manage the, rela the client relationship rather than the pilots. Um, so I think having that very, very close uh, and very strong uh, point of contact is, is really the way that we're managing our customers. So the pilots, that function is not to manage the customer, that's, that's the business's function. How excited are you about autonomous aircraft getting rid of pilots? <laughs> <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> Jenny. We, um, the way we manage our pilots is building on trust. Um, so, you know, they're a stakeholder uh, and, uh, you know, it's important that, you know, they are one of us and, you know, we have shared goals. So, you know, it's a lot of training and nurturing on that sense that to make sure, you know, we, we are able to, you know, have them, you know, performing a job where it's not threatening necessary. You know, we don't, we don't see them as threatening to us. We do have a culture that, you know, we, we're more of a encouraging and nurturing and managing through that way. So I say that as you're very excited about getting rid of pilots. <laughs> totally. It's, well, yeah. <laughs> At times, depending on, yeah, the, if it's a good pilot, yeah. But I have someone else do that job for me. <laughs> okay. Um, staying on the topic of big, da big data, which I, I think big D is, are any of you interested in obtaining it? If so, is there room for a new third party independent provider in the market? That's a, from a third party independent provider in the market. All right? We're already committed. Okay. Um, you say it is a good thing that OEMs are buying up MROs, but are they not just removing an operator's choice of where they can service their aircraft? The operator still has a choice. We're still here. Jet Aviation still exists, and we do, we do provide a choice. So the operator has a choice as long as it's Jet Aviation. Is that what you're saying? Quite <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Uh, safety programs, quick comment. You all have safety programs in your fleet? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, all right. And finally, when you <laughs> stay in hotels... Do you prefer boutique hotels or big faceless <laughs> <laughs> chain hotels? Boutique ones. <laughs> no, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I, I, I assumed you guys were like Airbnb. Um, can you get the name of that person? So I know, yeah, it's anonymous. <laughs> um, and finally, if we've got any more questions from the audience, the, what's nice to see is that 62% of the audience is operators. 17% are lawyers. Are there lawyers in the room? I think 17% <laughs> of the room is lawyers, <laughs> who clearly have the hardest job in aviation. Yeah, operators. <laughs>
Um, it's a hard job, but you get to bill by the hour, so it's not that bad. Um, any more questions? Okay, finally, when your alarm clock goes in the morning um, in your boutique hotel, do you, do you already know what's going to be your problem each day? No, no, not at all. That's the, that's the whole challenge. Is I've, I've no idea. You know, take, take, a, take a menu of a thousand things and, uh, yeah, it can be anything, which is part of the excitement and part of the challenge at the same time. Yeah, every day is different, I think. Yeah. That's true. Every day is different. Okay, and final, final question. 2020, are you guys going to grow significantly, grow slightly, lose aircraft? Uh, I'm in business development, so we're going to grow slightly. <laughs> grow slightly. <laughs> well, I think we already diversify lots of our offerings. So from a company perspective, I believe, you know, we'll continue to grow with all our service offering. So grow slightly or grow significantly? Well, depending on how 2019 is doing, looking at all those external data, I think we'll be growing slightly. Grow slightly. To answer the question, that's the same for us. And on that bombshell, that they're going to grow slightly. Thank no, no, you. No, no, We're going to grow, but it depends on how 2019 turns out. Otherwise, it could be quite significant. You heard it here first. 2020, grow slightly. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. That was great. Um, any more questions, they're going to be around for coffee. Um, and, and please keep using Slido.